Hi, from Experiment Nation, my name is Romo Santiago, and welcome to Experiment Nation The Conference Reloaded, a series where we share some of the best sessions from our most recent conference. So my name is Scott Sanders, I'm with Evaletics, and I'm here to talk about using chi-square analyses for ABN testing. So let's start by talking about what a chi-square test is. A chi-square test is a basic statistic that is used to analyze relationships in categorical data. So categorical data is simply counts, right? It's how often something occurs or appears. And, but it's not simply enough to know how often something appears. We, we need to know whether the frequency in which it appears is different from what we would expect based on chance. So for example, if I was to take a coin and flip it 10 times, we might expect it to come up five times head, five times tails. But in the real world, we know that a lot of times it'll come up, you know, four times heads, six times tails, and so forth. But it might, you might be very suspicious if it comes up nine times heads and one times tails. And so a chi-square test is basically designed to look at these sorts of counts and tell us something about it. And the beauty of it is, is that a chi-square is not limited to two categories. In fact, it's, you can use as many categories as you like, um, albeit it becomes harder to achieve significance. When we think about this in relationship to a traditional proportions test, where we are looking at multiple, uh, multiple variants compared to a control, we would have to conduct multiple pairwise comparisons. And so the number of variants times the number of variants minus one divided by two is the formula that's going to tell us how many comparisons we're going to need to make. So, for example, say we have four variants. Four times four minus one divided by two is equal to six. If we're going to be statistically rigorous, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to adjust our p-value, our alpha, uh, so that we have a new alpha, a new value. Uh, so we take 0 0.05 divided by six and we get 0 0.008. Now, why do we do this? Well, to understand that, we need to go back and consider like what is actually going on. What is type 1 error in alpha? So type 1 error is the chance of detecting a difference between our control and experimental variant when in fact there no difference actually exists. And we as the researchers are put in a position where we can determine our alpha. We, we actually set this ahead of time. And by convention, we're often going to set this at 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Sometimes people set it at 0.1 when they want to set a reduced confidence. Uh, and what this means is that we have to exceed that value, right? So if we set it at 0 0.05, which is often kind of the, the, the standard, we would have to exceed that value 5% of the time in order for our null hypothesis to be true. So if we want to represent this on a curve, our curve represents essentially all possible outcomes for a test. Uh, and so some of these outcomes are really likely to occur and they make up the center portion of our curve and the other outcomes are less likely to occur and they make up that tail of the curve, right? The type one error is that portion of the curve that is beyond our threshold that we set, in this case 0 0.05. And so this is the region that we are going to reject our null hypothesis in, but it's also the alpha for our test. It's also the type 1 error, our chance of being wrong. So how does this relate to multiple comparisons? So if we have a 5% chance of making an error uh, each time we conduct a test, then ABN tests with more than two conditions can result in inflation of type one error. So, for example, to calculate the chance of error across multiple tests, we can consider the likelihood of not making an error. So, uh, in this case, for instance, an ABC test, you know, with three conditions, we have an alpha of 0 0.05. So we're going to say one, which is our total probability, minus 0 0.05, which is our chance of making an error. Right, so it's 0.95. So it's 0.95 times 0.95 times 0.95. We get 0.86, or we can just raise the uh, that value to the number of our tests. And so one way of thinking about this is is that we now have a 14% chance of making error because we've conducted three different comparisons. And so uh, type one error. One way of controlling it is with an omnibus test. Omnibus is Latin for all. Uh, and this is going to test if any of these conditions are different from one another. So in continuous data, the common omnibus test that people use is an ANOVA. But with uh, categorical data, what we would actually use is a chi-square test. So an omnibus test allows researchers to test, uh, the value, you know, test for a difference uh, among all conditions simultaneously. And then only if we found a significant difference will we actually go in and we'll compare each one 
of our cells or each one of our conditions. And so the initial test is just as sensitive as conducting a, an analysis, these p-value analysis comparisons, but we're only using one test, uh, greatly kind of speeding up the process of kind of analysis, particularly if you have multiple uh, conditions that you're gonna be testing. And so generally we would expect, as I mentioned previously, that we wanna see these before we're gonna go in and conduct the pairwise comparison. So let's talk about like what the chi-square test is actually good for. So the first thing to understand about this is that there's actually two different flavors, two different types of chi-square tests, but luckily they're calculated almost identically. So we have a goodness of fit test. This tests whether the observed data for a single variable will fit our expectations of what that data should look like. So when might you use this? So let's say that you have observational data, something where you haven't conducted a manipulation, but you have a segmented data set and you're saying like, all right, well, which of these groups is more or less likely to occur, uh, to travel, to go to this page or to convert, right? This is one test that you could potentially use in this case. Uh, goodness of fit tests also allow you to check for your sample allocation. So you have different uh, counts in each one of our A, B, C, on out to N, uh, test and we can see whether or not based upon our probabilities that we specified uh, whether or not our sample has been appropriately allocated and note that it doesn't have to be an equal allocation right we can alloc as we'll see we can we can manipulate a goodness of fit test for any any proportionate allocation uh, the second type of chi-square test is referred to as a test of independence and these are whether two variables are independent of one another whether there's a relationship between these so this might be our experimental variance and conversions, right? Uh, this is one way it helps control type one error because we're testing kind of all these things all at once. And so we don't actually have to do an adjustment on our p-value. Um, it's already been done for us in this case. Uh, the second thing that we might use a, a test of independence for is we might use it to look at segmented data. So uh, remember that even when, you know, when we do multiple comparisons between, for instance, experimental variants, we need to do this adjustment. We are also gonna have to do this for segmentation. All right, finally, and I think that probably the coolest use of chi-square is that it allows us to have a dependent variable that has more than one, more than two outcome variables. So in a proportions test, you're limited to having a dichotomous outcome. You know, it's either they either converted or they didn't convert. Uh, with a chi-square test, we can actually have different levels. Uh, and it doesn't have to be ordered necessarily, but we can have different types of outcomes. And so in this case, imagine a scenario in which we want to know whether someone converted, but we also have a, we have a silver or a gold plan, or we have some sort of tiered system, or we have multiple options, things that they could choose during the conversion process. A chi-square analysis lets us know whether one of these is more likely to be selected than another. So what are the assumptions of a chi-square test? First, we assume that the samples are randomly formed, right? That, they, uh, that they're independent of one another. The data has to be nominal. So we're looking for things like group membership or frequency counts. Uh, finally, the, pardon me, the cells have to be independent or mutually exclusive. So what does this mean? It means that you can't both be in the conversion cell and in the non-conversion cell. You can't both be in you know, variant A and in the control. This seems intuitive, but it's worth stating. Uh, there's some ca ca categories and analysis where someone, you know, someone could potentially end up in both uh, cells. Uh, an example I often use in uh, my classes when I taught this was we would talk about like doing social research and having people who were multiracial, right, and might might be classified in multiple groups. We would have to come up with a rule in order to place them in one category and, and for the purposes of analysis. And then finally, no cell value should be less than five for the expected frequency. Uh, this is generally considered to be a prerequisite for conducting a chi-square analysis. There is something called a Yates correction, which you can look up. I'm not gonna cover it today, uh, but it will allow you to conduct a chi-square analysis if for, for some reason you do have a, an expected frequency that is less than five. All right, so to calculate a chi-square test, we need the following. We need the observed frequency count, so basically what we see uh, from our, our, our observed data. Uh, observed data is gonna come from that data. It's gonna be the same for both types of tests. The other thing we're gonna need is we're gonna need our expected frequency for each cell. And this actually differs from test to test. Now, our null is different from our expected frequencies per mean. 
Our null is that the expected frequencies do not differ from our observed uh, cell frequencies. And so we're saying FO is equal to FE. Right? This is our null hypothesis, uh, observed and expected. So let's let's talk about how to generate these expected frequencies first, and then we'll dive into how to calculate the test. The, the thing that I love about the chi-square test is that it is such an intuitive test. It's easy to calculate. You could teach someone uh, you know, in seventh grade how to do this quite well uh, because the mathematics behind it are very simple. Uh, and it's really just a matter of learning the process. And it, it's easy to do in Excel. You don't need fancy statistical uh, software to do. Uh, you can do it pretty much uh, using any, you can do it pen and paper or anything. You don't need a calculator. It's great. Uh, so how do you, how do you, what, 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 do, what do you get from the goodness of fit test? So goodness of fit tells us, um, can chance account for our observed frequencies? Or alternatively, do we have a theory that can account for our proposed frequencies? So we can calculate frequencies on the basis of chance. And so if there's no reason to think otherwise, our expected frequencies, we're going to derive them equally. So if we go back to my coin flip example, we would probably want to use a 50-50 split because there's no reason to think that the outcomes wouldn't be equal. Uh, and this is generally how we're going to treat it. But our other option is that we can actually derive uh, our expected frequencies on the basis of some sort of knowledge or theory. So let's talk about how this would occur. So let's say that we have 300 cases and we want to allocate equally across four conditions. So we can simply divide 300 by four. This is our chance theory, right? We're just allocating them equally. But let's say on the other hand that we have a purposefully allocated uh, these things uh, differently. Uh, for some reason, uh, maybe we consider them to be more risky. We are going to allocate uh, these disproportionately between these two groups. Uh, this is fine, by the way, uh, with uh, kind of chi-square analysis. You can do this. And so in this case, what we're going to do is our expected frequencies is going to be based upon the percent allocated, right? We would simply multiply that percent allocated by our total N, and we would get what we would expect in this case. Uh, the test of independence is going to differ slightly because what we're actually modeling here is we're actually saying, are these two things related to one another? You can think about this as the categorical version of correlation. And so in this case, we have variant convert and we have conversion. So yes, no, we have variant A, B and C. And you can see that we have uh, kind of row marginals. These are the ones in purple and we have kind of column marginals, which are in our orange. Uh, the nice thing about this, and you'll see this on the next slide, uh, is that if these are added up, uh, our row marginals and column marginals will equal the same thing, right? So they kind of they lead to our n. So we have our frequency of row, frequency of column, and our total cases n. And so here's our observed data. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we actually calculate our expected frequencies here. And so our observed data, we're going to do this for each cell. And so to get each cell expected frequency, we're going to multiply the row marginal by its respective column marginal, and we're going to divide it by the total number of cases, in this case, n. And so in this case, we have 202 times 2000 divided by 6000. Now note that in this case, we have kind of this, we have kind of a similarity in how we've got the same column marginal uh, for each, each condition. This, and, so we're going to have kind of very similar calculations here. So it's a different 2000, but it's the same, same, same calculation and so forth. And we can see I've got them highlighted over here. We're kind of rotating through and we're doing the respective problem here. So we get these are our calculations. Once we actually do these calculations, we'll find that the expected frequencies uh, are this. We have 67.33 for our yeses and 1932.67 for our nose. Again, if, if these are not exactly equal between our variants, which in most cases we would not expect them to be, uh, then we might have something that's very, very different. Um, okay, so in order to figure out what is and is not significant, we do need to know about degrees of freedom. So in chi-square tests, the degrees of freedom represent the number of cell entries that are free to vary 
and can still add up to the row and column marginals, right? Remember, the marginals are the fancy word for the total, on the, the row total and the column total. And so this differs slightly from degrees of freedom and something like a t-test or an ANOVA, where we're looking at basically how many of the scores can vary and still add up to a given mean. So in this case, we're trying to add up to the marginals, not the mean. And so we have our goodness of fit. So we have our k, k is for column, so k minus 1. And so 3 minus 1 equals 2. So two of these things, variant A, B, and C, that, that value could be anything we wanted, but it just has to be whatever it's going to take in order for it to add up to 6,000. With the test of independence, we have k minus 1 times r minus 1. And this is going to give us the number of cells that are free to vary and still add up to the row and column marginals. And so in this case, two cells can vary, but once those two cells are fixed, everything else is going to be predetermined. And so we, know, we, can, and we can infer what the remaining values would have to be. So one thing of note, uh, unlike a T distribution, a chi-square distribution is not symmetrical. In fact, it's, it's very, very skewed. And note that as we our degrees of freedom increase, the critical value becomes more and more extreme. Right? This means that the more variance or conditions you test with a chi-square uh, test, the, the harder it is to achieve significance. Why is this the case? The, this is the case because, in fact, a chi-square test is baking in that adjustment to the critical value, to our p-value, uh, yeah, pardon me, let's, let's be clear, to our p-value, our type 1 error, that is necessary in order for us to do these kind of multiple comparisons. You would have to do this by hand with a Bonferroni adjustment if you're using proportions testing. And so, uh, it becomes less skewed as it gets, uh, the degrees of freedom gets larger, but it also becomes harder to achieve significance. So we're now to the point where we're calculating our chi-square. This is beautiful. It's beautiful in part because of how simple it is. I'm going to walk you through the formula, and then we're going to actually look at an example of this together. So first, we calculate our expected frequencies for each cell. We've done that. Next, for each cell, we're going to take our frequency observed and we're gonna minus by our frequency expected. Now, the thing that I love about this is that it's so forgiving because even if you mess this up, it doesn't really matter because we are actually gonna square that value. And so if you flip it around and mess it up, it's, it's okay um, because it will still turn out to be a positive value because of that square. And then finally, we're gonna divide it by our frequency expected. And then the sigma here basically means that we're gonna sum it all up. And so let's, let's look at an example here. So calculating chi-square. We've got our observed and our expected. I've got the cells highlighted in their respective tables over here on the right. And we're going to do this for each one of these cells. Oh, that's a mistake. That should be, uh, no, it's, no, it's not a mistake. Um, and so now we have the calculation set up. If we were to calculate this, these are the values that we would actually get. And so the final portion, the final section of a chi-square is we're actually going to take this and we're going to add this up. We're going to get 37.66. You would, uh, you, pardon me, six, uh, yeah, 37.66. We're going to compare this to our critical value in a table, and that would tell us whether or not we have a significant result. So here comes the fun part. How do we know, let's go back to this, how do we know which one of these cells is driving the difference? Is it A and B? Are they are they different from one another? Is it C different from one another? We can eyeball it, right? But like we don't really want to eyeball it. We want to know. And so how can we determine this by, by like using some sort of hard fast criterion? So one way to determine this is to actually look at the adjusted residuals uh, as a type of post hook analysis. So uh, what it, what are we doing here? An adjusted residual, I'm not going to walk you through each, each one of these steps, but an adjusted residual is basically saying, well, what is this difference and how can we kind of standardize this difference? So it's frequency observed minus the frequency expected over the square root of the frequency expected times 1 minus the row marginal over n times 1 minus the column marginal over n. We're going to do this for each cell. And what this is going to do is we, we are going to get these uh, adjusted standardized residuals, and these are going to give us a hint 
about which one of these differed. Now, the nice thing about these is these, these adjusted standardized residuals, these are Z values, right? Like they're, we can actually look them up in a Z test or from a Z table to determine whether or not these are significant. In fact, if we wanna do this, now we would actually conduct our adjustment of our p-value, right? We would look at the number of comparisons and we could adjust this, uh, adjust it in order to find the appropriate z-value. So if you have six, you can use the same formula for variance. If you have six, uh, six uh, cells in this case, six times five divided by two, you'd have 15 comparisons. That's basically how you would do it. Uh, in this case, and the work in this case, we're not comparing against variant. We're comparing each cell to one another. The reason we do this is that you don't really need to do it when you have a, a, a dichotomous outcome like convert but not convert. But if you had a value that was, for instance, like not convert, silver plan, gold plan, then we would really want to know which of these cells would differ from one another. In this case, they're they're symmetrical to one another because it's just yes no. But in non-dichotomous variables, you really need to do this in order to figure out exactly where the difference lies. Uh, so do you need to do this adjustment on the p-value adjustment for these? Maybe. All right. There's some there's some there's a number of people who uh, like Alan Agresti, who's a well-known statistician who likes categorical, who specializes in categorical data. Uh, he recommends that, like, yes, you can do this. But he also says as long as you have a significant chi-square result up front, you can use this primarily for interpretation. And so I, I would not hold strictly to the adjusted p-values in this case because we already know we have a significant result. And in fact, it's possible to get a significant result. And once you do the adjustments, not have a significant value here. That being said, because we know that there's already some difference that's present, uh, I think it's fair in a lot of cases to basically, once you have these standardized re adjusted residuals, to use them for interpretation rather than using kind of a, a strong adjustment, uh, uh, strong uh, kind of uh, correction on these. Now, one thing I want to warn you about is you should never attempt to uh, uh, interpret the residuals in the presence of a non-significant test. You really have to have that significant chi-square test before you're gonna come in and you're gonna look at this. All right, so to recap, what have we talked about? We talked about like the problem of uh, type one error and the problem of multiple comparisons. This is, this is pretty basic stuff. I expect that most of you guys already know this. Um, but the nice thing about the chi-square test is it accounts for type one and multiple comparisons because it's already baked into the statistic and we see that with the, the degrees of freedom, remember? The other thing about chi-square test uh, is that it's like a really simple statistic. It's it's beautiful and it's easy to calculate. Uh, like as we point out, it controls for type one error, um, but it allows us to have more than one dichotomous outcome. So uh, I had a dichotomous outcome in my slides today simply because it's easier to fit on the screen. Uh, but you can do the same thing with an outcome that has three or four or even five uh, outcomes. Uh, you can uh, you can also have multiple conditions, right? So like you can get these tables really big. Um, now remember, as, as the table size grows, you're less likely to achieve significance, but you can, you can do this. Um, it also allows you to check, for instance, your sample allocation across multiple conditions. So there, there's a d bunch of different uh, kind of applications for the statistic. Uh, and so, uh, and finally, we talked about how to calculate a chi-square test and conduct a post-token analysis. So, uh, I want to leave you guys with a thought today. I understand that like we're all really familiar with using proportions testing uh, in kind of a marketing context. But when all you have is a hammer, everything just looks like a nail. And I want to encourage you to think beyond that. When you see a problem that maybe chi-square is a good uh, fit for, uh, maybe think about applying this. Now, if you're not comfortable with the math or you, you, you feel like that this might be something that is like not something you want to try right off the bat, we at Evalytics have a number of chi-square calculators available to you. We have one that is on our website, but we've also got an Excel calculator that you can download. Uh, it does dichotomous outcomes, and it will actually do the residuals for you uh, as well. Uh, so that you have an opportunity to kind of try this out, to use it on your own uh, without necessarily having to worry about the calculations the first time around. And, and as you gain competence and, and confidence in this technique, uh, you probably won't need it any longer. So I want to thank you for your time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye.